Chelsea Football Club were once the most successful English club of the 21st century, with a squad full of legendary players, coached by world-class managers, and with an owner that completely revolutionized the club, the league, and ultimately the sport itself. Since their highest of highs of winning the Champions League for a second time in the summer of 2021, and following that up with the club's first Club World Cup a few months later though, nothing has ever been the same since. With a new man at the helm, a team full of completely new faces, and a league position that they haven't been in for more than two decades, the Todd Bowley era has gone off to a disaster class of a start, and it could still get much worse. From winning everything under Roman Abramovich, to having a change of ownership and spending over a billion pounds on exciting young players, the club is languishing in mid-table for a successive season, and that's only the peak of the iceberg of the problems they're facing. This is the story of how one man took over a side that was a few players away from getting back to the top of the table and went on to create a case study for what is quite possibly the worst football administration of recent times. Some people like to say that Chelsea was already a big club before Abramovich got there, but you'd have to be very generous with your definition of what a big club is to back that statement. They had some good players, usually towards the end of their careers, and even though they won a few things in the 1990s, they held a total of one league title, a few FA Cups and League Cups, and a couple of Cup Winners' Cups to their name. In other words, they were pretty much a Tottenham without the trophy drought. Abramovich himself has a very interesting story that deserves a full standalone video, but he was cunning and became very wealthy particularly during the privatization of state companies following the Soviet Union's dissolution, and he had a few spare hundreds of millions to play around with, so he decided to use that to make Chelsea into a super team. He broke all kinds of spending records at the time and brought in several high-profile players and managers over the years which took Chelsea from finishing between 11th and 3rd in the 8 seasons before him, to finishing between 3rd and 1st in his first 8 seasons in charge, winning 3 Premier League titles in the process. During his time in charge, Chelsea was the most successful team in England, winning the most trophies and twice becoming champions of Europe. In February 2022, Chelsea won the Club World Cup which was the final missing trophy for Abramovich to complete a clean sweep of winning everything he had competed in. Less than two weeks later though, Russia invaded Ukraine, he was placed in the UK's sanction list, and the ownership situation at Chelsea was in turmoil. That summer, he agreed to sell, sending the proceeds to the war victims in Ukraine, and Chelsea was now under the ownership of Clear Lake Capital with Todd Bowley at the helm. Bowley is an American businessman, born in 1973. He grew up in the US, going to university there before studying in the London School of Economics. It was in London where he started getting involved in the financial markets, and he's gone on to build a career in investing and asset management. From the early 2010s, he started getting involved in both sports and media. He owns 20% of the LA Dodgers baseball team and is a part owner of the LA Lakers in basketball, on top of owning multiple media publications and companies related to marketing and entertainment. He first tried to buy Chelsea in 2019, but Abramovich wasn't hearing it. When the opportunity presented itself to make the purchase in 2022, he leapt at it, as he led the Clear Lake Consortium in a $5.4 billion acquisition of the club. Abramovich's 19-year tenure, where Chelsea really established themselves as a force in the game, was now over, and a new era was underway. When Bowley first took over, it seemed like Chelsea were set to kick on. 12 months prior, they had won the Champions League. Six months later, they became world champions, and they had just finished third after having to deal with the ownership situation looming over their heads for the last few months of the season. The fans were sad to lose one of the best owners in football history, but not even the biggest doubters could foresee the absolute disaster class that was about to unfold in front of them. Todd Bowley wanted a new beginning from top to bottom, bringing in his own people. One of his first moves was to start purging the boardroom, notably getting rid of one of the best sporting directors in the game in Marina Granovskaya, who had been at the club since 2014. She had been responsible for some amazing business, being renowned for selling deadwood and underperforming players for much more than they were worth. His short-term solution for a new sporting director? Himself. Bowley decided to work with manager Thomas Tuchel on bringing new players into the club, and he wasn't shy about spending. 
That first transfer window, he brought in 9 players for almost £250 million. He brought in a few young players and other more experienced players, but only one or two of them addressed the areas that Tuchel was actually looking to strengthen. With his background in baseball that we mentioned earlier, Boldy thought that he was about to revolutionize football. Big signings and exciting young players in the past used to sign on for five, sometimes six year contracts. Seeing himself as a futurist, he decided to introduce eight and nine year contracts, effectively tying players down for the majority of their careers. If you look at that at face value, it could actually seem like a good idea. But as we'll circle back around to later, that isn't necessarily always the case. At this point, he also set a precedent for overspending, especially in paying above market value for players like Mark Kukureya and Wesley Fofana. The former has been terrible, and the latter has been injured for pretty much his entire time at the club so far. But more damaging than anything was the view of Chelsea under him as a club who were willing and able to spend unreasonable sums of money to get who they wanted. The season got off to a terrible start, and then it just kept getting worse. Tuchel was sacked within four league games after the transfer window had closed, following consistent clashes and disagreements with the ownership. His replacement was Graham Potter, a man who had managed impressively in Sweden and more recently at Brighton, but never anywhere near a club the size of Chelsea. They paid Brighton £21 million to sign him, giving him a five-year contract to mould the team in his image for years to come. Potter didn't even last a full season in charge. And in April of 2023, seven months into that five-year deal, he was paid £13 million in compensation to leave the club. During that time, he was in charge of the January transfer window, where sporting director Todd Bowley was now set on a strategy of spending above market value for young players to sign contracts spanning the best part of a decade, and he wasn't going to face any opposition from the struggling manager. He brought in another eight players, all of them between 18 and 22, spending £300 million in the process. Again, he proved that he was more than happy to overpay on players for the sake of getting the deal done, which was especially the case for Enzo Fernandez and Mikhailo Mudrik, who we'll go into later. Poulter was sacked because results never improved for the team, and he ended up going down as the Chelsea manager with the worst win percentage of the 21st century winning just 39% of his games in charge. In his defense, he was dealing with a ridiculously bloated squad, full of players that were unhappy and many of which were set to leave in the summer, and reportedly faced disrespect from many of the players who never thought he should have been appointed in the first place. Club legend Frank Lampard was brought in to see off the rest of the season, which continued with terrible results and ended up leaving Chelsea in 12th place when all was said and done their second worst performance in Premier League history, and their worst since 1994. Going into the summer of 2023, it was clear that radical changes were needed, and radical changes there were. The decision to get rid of most of the boardroom, one of the best in football at the time that Clear Lake Capital took over, wasn't a particularly great one. But now they had new people in charge. Some were signed and sacked within months before they even really had time to settle. But the biggest job was once again in the transfer market, where new sporting directors were now in place to oversee the club's business. They signed ex-Tottenham boss Maurizio Pochettino, promising him time to develop the squad as individuals and as a collective, based on his past experience with Spurs, where he got them to finish second in the league once, alongside getting to two cup finals and losing them both. The main goal at first was to get Chelsea back into Europe, and as we'll see later on, that was more important than most people realized at the time. They continued Chelsea's record of being able to sell underperforming squad players for hefty prices, particularly with selling Mason Mount with less than a year to go in his contract for 60 million and getting 65 million for an underperforming Kai Havertz. They ended up making almost 250 million on player sales, selling most of their sellable assets and reinvesting all of that into another round of nonsensical spending. When all was said and done, they spent another £400 million on new players. The overspending that they had done for two windows in a row continued for the third, and now they had a track record for doing so, so we can assess the insanity for what it was. Mudrik, who had played less than 50 league games in the Ukrainian First Division and scored less than 10 league goals, could cost up to £90 million. 
Enzo Fernandez, who had been signed by Benfica for a potential 18 million euros six months prior, cost 121 million euros in January off the back of a good World Cup. Moises Caicedo, who had been a starter for a single season at Brighton, signed a deal that could be worth up to 115 million pounds. That's not to mention the 60 million for Kukureya, who has been terrible, and the 80 million for Wesley Fofana, who's been injured for his entire stay at the club so far. It's all fun and games to be playing what essentially amounts to a FIFA career mode save with the infinite budget toggled on. But real life actions tend to have real life consequences, and these are set to come back to bite Chelsea hard. You see, back in 2011, when clubs like Chelsea and Manchester City, with no real tradition or track record of spending big in the game, started buying whoever they wanted for as much money as it cost with no restrictions, UEFA decided to implement financial fair play rules. These are a bit of a joke, and Manchester City particularly have gotten away with breaking them and just hiring an army of the best lawyers around to get them out of it. But since then, the individual leagues have also added their own restrictions. The Premier League has its profit and sustainability regulations, which prohibit Premier League clubs from accumulating losses in excess of £105 million over a three-year period. Until recently, these tended to just be a footnote that people knew about but didn't really give much thought to, especially with City's 115 breaches seemingly getting kicked down the road indefinitely. This season though, Everton and more recently Nottingham Forest have had points deductions given for breaking the threshold. The lack of spending this January window is a clear indication that clubs took note of that, and they're clearly aware that they could be next. The last few years have seen football clubs crack down for overspending, be that in England or in Barcelona and Milan, and this is something quite unprecedented in the history of the game. That's a whole wider story that includes tycoons like Abramovich and states like Abu Dhabi buying up clubs and changing the face of the game, and it deserves a full video in and of itself. But if you're enjoying this one so far, don't forget to like the video, and if you're interested in the topics revolving around the world, people, geopolitics, and life lessons, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with all the videos we have coming your way. The explanation for how Chelsea was able to do all the spending they've done is through the concept of amortization. This is generally where you buy an asset and spread out its costs over the duration of its lifetime use. For example, if you own a factory and you're buying a machine for $1 million that you know has a lifespan of 10 years, Instead of it going down as a $1 million expense in year one of the accounts, it goes down as $100,000 for the next 10 years. Likewise in football, it's a concept that all clubs use to break down the cost of their transfers over the duration of the player's contract. Going back to the unprecedented eight-year contracts that we spoke about earlier, the goal of these was twofold. Keeping young players tied down for the bulk of their careers and being able to spread out their transfer costs throughout the duration of their contracts. For Enzo Fernandez, for example, his 121 million euro transfer was spread over his nine-year contract. That means that instead of his transfer going down in the books as a 121 million euro loss for 2023, it'll go down as a 13 million euro loss every year for the next nine years. The logic behind that was that the longer contracts meant that they would be able to spread the costs over a longer time period, which meant that they could sign more players as the costs in their books weren't as high. There's a reason clubs haven't done this in the past. With an eight or nine year contract, you have a legally binding commitment to these players for that long, even if they fail. Not all the signings have been failures, far from that. But the ones who are loss makers are going to be very expensive to get out of the club. What that also means though, is that for the next nine years, Chelsea will have a 13 million euro loss on their books from Enzo's transfer. If you add Mudrik's potential 10 million pounds per season, Caicedo's potential 12 million per season, Fofana's 10 million per season, and even Kukureya's 10 million per season, unless they sell him for a loss anyway, we're talking about at least 50 million pounds being put down as losses for the next four years until Kukureya's contract is over, and up to six or seven years for the others. Those are just some of the more expensive ones, but the squad itself is very large. So when you start adding everyone's totals up for the next few years, that number per year starts looking very big. 
the expenses on transfers alone are already very high. And that doesn't even factor in wages. Because of the length of the contracts and the ages of the players they signed, their wages aren't as high as many others, but it's still going to be a very large amount. There are no up-to-date figures for wages because clubs only have to submit their accounts a little after the fact. But in 2022, when Bowley took over, Chelsea's wages to revenue ratio was at 71%. Since then, they've sold some high earners, and even the mass influx of players probably didn't move the absolute value of the wages too much. But the revenue figure is where the problem lies. Clubs get money from three primary sources outside of player sales match days, broadcasting, and commercial. By being in Europe, and especially in the Champions League, not only do you get financially rewarded well from winning games and progressing, but you also get to put on more matches, more broadcasting revenue, and also get more visibility that leads people to want to buy more merchandise. Not being in Europe this season is going to be a hard hit on the club's finances, and that will be shown in the reports when they come out in the next year. But not making it for a second year in a row is gonna be tough. The thing is, while Chelsea spent more than a billion pounds on players since the takeover, they've been able to offset at least 300 million or so from players' sales and gotten other high earners off their books. At this point though, of the 32 players they have listed in their squad, at least 20 were brought in since 2022, and the majority of the rest are academy prospects. They've sold off the majority of the players that they could sell for big feats, and now it's hard not to see them having to get into the territory of selling players that have been performing for them like Conor Gallagher, even if they wouldn't particularly want to. The main way they had to get more revenue back into the club was to have success on the pitch, which hasn't exactly been the case. This season started with reserved optimism from some quarters. They had a squad that was added to and now a little older and more used to playing with each other. They had gotten rid of a lot of Deadwood, the new manager was used to working with younger players, and they didn't have European football to contend with. The early season optimism didn't last particularly long though, and fast forward to the March international break, and they're currently sat in 11th place. Chelsea already had a chance of getting into Europe, but lost the Carabao Cup final, and now they face City in the FA Cup semi-final, and if they fail to win that, their only route into Europe is through the league. As much as 11th place sounds bad, and being labelled as billion pound bottle drops isn't particularly inspiring, they're only 8 points off 6th with a game in hand. 7th or potentially even 8th could also get a spot in Europe depending on the winners of the Cups and the UEFA coefficients with the new changes to the Champions League format, so in theory it's easier than it's ever been to qualify for European competition. The thing is, the drop off in revenue between the Champions League and the other European competitions is huge, and they need to be in Europe's premier competition to make their spending even somewhat feasible to comply with the regulations. As we mentioned earlier, the profit and sustainability rules are measured over three year periods. By the end of next season, it'll have been three years of Clear Lake Capital's ownership over the club, and where they're at at that stage will have a lot to say about the club's long term prospects. They inherited Champions League football and its revenue in their first season, but assuming they don't manage that for next season and with the unlikely prospect of even Europa League football, this summer is going to be a bit of a crossroad. With a second successive season of no European football, there could already be alarm bells ringing and decisions made to be more cautious in the market, sell more players and dampen the concerns with their spending. On the other hand, it could also be that they decide they've already gone too far to back out and they double down on spending another 300 million to give themselves the best chance to get back into the Champions League and compete for the league. The bottom line regardless is that they chose to take on a long-term project that would take time to flourish. But they did that in a way that means they can't afford not to have the short run relative success to fund their spending. Chelsea essentially needs to make Europe. If they don't, then it would be hard to imagine they wouldn't have to deal with a points deduction which would probably see them at best miss another season in the Champions League and have to sell some of their assets for cheaper than they bought them for. The best case scenario is that they'd probably have to deal with the biggest points deduction given for profit and sustainability regulations that the Premier League has ever given, at least until City's trial is completed, unless they really do finesse that one. 
told Bowley's approach to the transfer market of signing a bunch of very young players on unprecedentedly long contracts for crazy money to build a squad that would last a decade wasn't genius. It was just a massive gamble. If it pays off, everyone improves and next season everything clicks, then he'll say it was warranted and that was the plan all along. If it doesn't click next season, him walking through the door essentially doomed Chelsea to an absolute minimum of half a decade of being in absolute shambles, epitomizing mediocrity after two decades of being on top of the world. English football has had no shortage of disastrous ownership situations in the past. And if you look at some of the lower league teams, especially in the championship, you can find plenty of examples of owners that decided to gamble by spending big to get promoted, failing and ending up being in League One a couple of years later. Leeds United in the early 2000s also had a situation where their owners took out loans, gambling on making the Champions League, only to miss out narrowly two seasons in a row and ending up having to sell their best players and going down to the third tier of English football as a result of the downward spiral they went on. As much as seeing Chelsea go through that would be a great sight as an Arsenal fan who grew up being tormented by them winning consistently, even during their worst periods, their situation realistically won't get to Leeds United scale. Realistically, if they don't make the Champions League next season, they're probably going to have to sell their most valuable assets, aside from their homegrown players, for below market value and continuing in mid-table for the foreseeable future for as long as they don't have an actual project of squad building in place. Upgrading Stamford Bridge or moving to a new ground entirely has also been spoken about for quite a while, but that would be another huge set of expenses. And with the way things are looking, that just isn't going to be a realistic project anytime soon. All of this that we've spoken about so far only relates to the current owners, but there could also be ghosts from the past that come back to haunt them. For all the success Chelsea had under Abramovich, there are also outstanding cases of off-the-book payments under his tenure that gave them a sporting advantage, like paying players and agents more than their disclosed transaction fees. If and when that goes to an independent commission, regardless of their current cooperation with these investigations and the fact that they took place under a different regime, we could also be looking at a big penalty. The PSR breaches from Everton and Forest give a general guideline for the penalties that they could face where we're talking about a 2 to 10 point deduction, possibly higher depending on the scale of how bad their overspending was. But the off-book payments would be an unprecedented case, similar to City's charges. And for that, determining any kind of penalty would be speculation, despite the fact that you could imagine it would be pretty severe. It's crazy to see how a team can go from being champions of Europe, with a squad that looked like it was only a few players from being one of the best in the world, and having one of the best sporting operations in football to being in this mess within three years. Situations like this end up providing a case study for those that actually choose to look into it and draw out lessons. The first one is thinking that you're a futurist and thinking you've spotted loopholes that no one in the history of the game has ever seen before you and thinking you're about to revolutionize the sport. Many have actually achieved this from Guardiola's tactics to Wenger's diets and even Fiorentino Perez's club building. Todd Bowley is just not that guy. Another one has to do with gambling. Sometimes they work and sometimes they just don't pay off. There are many ways to gamble in football, where you can mitigate the risks and spread them out over a longer time horizon. From the outset, this one looked reckless, with no consideration for the actual consequences that could result from them. Finally, thinking that buying more players is going to solve all your problems isn't necessarily the answer. Nowadays, the football transfer market is an attraction almost as big as the games themselves. Fabrizio Romano has built an audience of multiple millions off the back of that, and I've been well into it for over a decade as I started playing football manager back in 2009 with my PSP. But real life isn't like the games. You see clubs like City who have spent huge amounts of money but spent it with a purpose and a vision for what their team should look like. You see a club like Real Madrid, who have spent a bunch of money on young players, but also now have a squad that will probably be in the top one of world football for a decade without having to buy anyone. Even Arsenal have taken a team that finished eighth in back-to-back -back seasons and are having back-to-back -back title challenges with the best seemingly yet to come. Those are all examples of visions being executed knowing what you want the club to stand for and how you want them to play. 
and building a team based on that thesis over multiple years that compoundly grows year on year. Spending over the top on a bunch of young players because at least some of them will come good and having a squad that lacks cohesion, identity, a proper quality keeper, center back and striker is a strategy, it's just not a great one. The problems with the profit and sustainability rules might just be the case of how bad rather than whether they're gonna have to face them at this stage. And those off the book payments are most definitely gonna have some kind of impact on the club, whether that's a big points deduction, a massive fine, or something much worse. Regardless of whether the unlikely actually happens and this squad just clicks and starts producing results, the damage may already have been done at this point. Only time will tell its severity and what that will actually mean for the future of the club. If you're interested in football and some stories about players, make sure you check out this video we made about Neymar. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like the video and if you're interested in topics regarding the world, people, geopolitics and life lessons, don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with all the videos we have coming your way. We're still just getting started and there's a whole lot more to come. I'll see you next time.